Good evening and welcome to Resistance TV. It's Wednesday and it's 7pm and tonight we're talking to Councillor Mandy Clare who's an in independent councillor now. Uh, she's recently left the Labour Party and she's been working on a project um, around the, the poverty emergency. Um, as we emerged out of our first COVID lockdown in spring 2020, a window for potentially reimagining society, poverty and inequality opened up. So uh, Mandy's going to discuss with me tonight what a genuine social justice and localised approach to tackling poverty might look like and shares some recent experiences and insight from working to embed this at her local council level. So I'd like to um, first... Um, Welcome, Mandy. Um, and I would say, um, just uh, for people in the chat, can we keep the chat comradely and um, polite, be kind to each other? Um, and if there is any harassment or bullying within the chat, we will have to remove you from the chat this evening. Um, so welcome, Mandy. Hiya. How are you? Very good, thanks. You're thanks all right. Okay. Yes. Good. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, so first of all, can you tell us why you stood to be a councillor for the Labour Party in the first place? How did that come about? OK, um, I mean, I've always been or considered myself to be a socialist and that's the first thing. And I've always voted Labour, but I didn't see any particular reason to join the party until 2015 um, when Corbyn was elected as leader. Um, and it was just a big sigh of relief, really, for me, like for a lot of other people, that there was someone there representing socialism, which hadn't been represented politically, you know, um, on the national stage, really, for however long. And um, I wanted to see more, having been involved in that sort of Corbyn movement for a couple of years as an activist and getting more and more involved and sucked in, as you do, um, I wanted to see more working class people in positions of influence within that movement because I was really worried that we were becoming quite disconnected from voters in red wall seats. You know, when we went out and did door knocking and things like that, it was apparent that a lot of the media smears that were happening against Corbyn were really taking hold with people. People were taking them on board and it felt as if there'd been almost like a galvanising of, you know, um, more middle class or more affluent people towards that movement and the issues that were being talked about where, you know, a lot of them were things that people who are a little bit more financially comfortable are able to talk about and take an interest in and become activists around. Um, and I really wanted to hear some more working class voices at the top table and as the face of the Labour Party representing some of those amazing policies that we had. Um, and it didn't seem to be becoming any easier. There weren't any pathways really being created to make it easier for people from working class backgrounds to be able to do that within the party. So I kind of, I wouldn't say that I elbowed my way forward, but we needed someone to represent one of our wards in uh, the constituency that I was a member of. Um, and I'd been involved a few years, you know, I'd had a few different roles within the CLP and I thought, well, I'll, I'll put myself forward um, and give it a go. And um, the interesting thing is, is that um, in doing that, because um, I, I, I went for a few different opportunities because I felt fairly, fairly worried about it and fairly determined that that needed to change and that it needed to be made sort of more of an inclusive movement, um, you know, with regards working class people. And through doing that, um, people said to me, you know, that people say about you that you're a careerist and that you've gone for this and you've gone for that. And it's kind of like, I don't know, <laughs> I did it anyway. Mm. Um, I got I got the highest majority out of the um, the different candidates that stood for Labour within within the town, within Winsford. Um, I'm not from Winsford, you know, so it's taken a little bit to try and get my head around what the local issues are and try and make connections with people. Yeah. Um, but that was it, really. It was just that I felt... It's not it's not enough for us to have one or two working class voices that are very tamed, um, that won't step out of line, that will ham up their working classness when it suits, but that aren't actually there to speak for and on behalf of working class people. Um, and I, I wanted to see that change. I wanted to see a cultural change in the Corbyn movement around that. Mm. Um, before I ask you the next question, Randy, um, I do yeah. have to ask you, why did you leave the Labour Party? That's probably a whole show in itself. <laughs> 
but um just give us the a highlight do you know what i feel like the rot set in at the point when people were being mistreated and smeared unfairly over um their support for palestine um that's when i felt that things went wrong and i felt at that very point there if the leadership doesn't stand up for these people it's only going to get worse um so i <laughs> carried on because obviously as we all did we wanted that chance didn't we to get into number 10 and make the phenomenal difference that we knew that it would make however imperfect it was however much further people might have wanted to see it go you know me I wanted to see it go further for working class people and not just speak for us but have you know our representatives from the working class at the front at the front face at the coal face really visible um but regardless of that we all knew we all knew what was at stake and that, you know, maybe this was our last shot really of being able to do this. Um, so I stayed a member, even though I wasn't happy that people were being smeared and that they weren't being defended. Um, I was really impressed with the, with the stand that Chris took against that. It was very principled, I thought. Um, by that, by the time it had got really, really bad, <laughs> I'd been elected as a councillor and um, been appointed to this poverty emergent, uh, not poverty, um, leaders champion for poverty and inequality role. And and then soon after I, I got um, asked if I would stand for the National Women's Committee as well. And I'd kind of, I wanted to try and remain involved as, as a member of the Labour Party to try and see through as far as possible, as much of the work that I could on women's rights with as part of the National Women's Committee. And um, in terms of a social justice approach to poverty rather than like a charitable approach to poverty within the council. And I'd managed to make a certain amount of headway with both of those things. I felt like I had a platform for both of those things that as a working class woman, I wouldn't easily get that kind of a platform again. Um, I didn't want to just abandon those things whilst I still felt that I could make a difference, but really, throughout um, the last couple of years within the Labour Party as a councillor at the local level. You know, I, I did say in my um, statement when I left the Labour Party that I'd experienced a lot of bullying. Um, I'd experienced a lot of really severe pushback against things that we'd signed up to as a full council. Um, my job after getting us signed up to the poverty emergency was to lead on and deliver a strategy based around that declaration. Um, but things kept getting you know I'm um, diluted diluted out of it and um, I wasn't invited me to, to meetings that I should have been invited to and you know I was kind of barked at in meetings and there was all kinds of horrible stuff going on mm. and it was relentless the, the kinds of tactics that people who enjoy positions of power become used to using in order to not do something they don't want to do or to gloss it up as if they are doing it when they really don't want to do it is endless and so, you know, trying to kind of fight that off week to week, day to day was really, really exhausting. And then on top of that, I had a lot of um, opposition. Like when I was speaking up within the National Women's Committee, I felt, you know, we all know, and it's it's hit the media now, the issues around women's rights and trans rights has been really, really divisive across the left and across politics generally. A lot of it, I think, uh, women in particular are only just starting to wake up to across the general public, like how far some of this has gone, because there's been a culture of no debate and bullying. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I used my opportunity on that platform, the National Women's Committee, to say, look, you know, I'm having reports from women telling me that they're being bullied or that they're being singled out when they're putting themselves forward for positions within the party um on the basis of their views and their views are legally protected and they've got a right to ask some of these questions and to say some of these things without being harassed or discriminated mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. um when i tried to raise some of these things it, they weren't minuted you know um i was silenced i was told it wasn't the right agenda item i was told that it wasn't we weren't it wasn't the right meeting you know uh, the right forum or i was told that um trans women are women, you know, end of conversation. Um, and I was trying to raise, you know, issues where women have shared examples of bullying and, and discrimination, which is serious, mm. um, curtailment of their free speech, which is serious. And I was trying to say, I did ask outright, can we please have 
um, can we facilitate as the National Women's Committee with the right people to facilitate a respectful and evidence based debate around some of these issues where there's mm -hmm. been enforced silence? You know, um, we've never had that debate. We've never had the debate about some of these really important things that affect women, that affect children, that affect safeguarding, that affect how gay, how being gay is defined, you know, some of these critical issues. We can, it's not beyond the will of us to have that conversation respectfully. You know, and um, we could create a women's uh, assembly to discuss some of these things. But um, the, the, like I said, I, I wasn't minuted. Um, I started to report publicly in my own regular bulletins to the electorate, the female electorate. Like this is what I've asked for. This is what I've said. I've emailed, you know, and asked for this. I've followed the blah blah blah, just so that people were aware that I was trying to do something. Um, mm. But I think that went down really, really badly. And then. Um, the disciplinary system within the parties started to be screws started to be tightened with that and that that was used against me in a really discriminatory way um it's actually something that i have spoken to a lawyer about and i might take further at some point so it, i had a I so had, not a nice not a nice experience then monday it was um, a bit of a rough ride and I, I could have waited it out you know i'd been removed from the council selection panel um on dubious grounds um i'd had a letter from the party to say can you explain yourself with regards to this uh post and it was it was uh, something that i'd liked which was you know the socialist appeal and i'd done that before it was proscribed so they kind of wheeled that out pulled that one out of the bag as well they just wanted to get rid of me so i thought well rather than waiting they might drop the axe a year from now just before the next local election so that there's the minimum damage yeah. so rather than it be on their terms i'm going to go on international women's day and i'm going to make a strong statement about why i've gone so. brilliant well Labour's <laughs> loft is resist gain i'm pleased to say that mandy has joined resist um she's on our steering committee um she's joined our media hub um and our policy committee so um she's now going to be helping us make policy for our new political party and she's also the coordinator for the northwest so we're extremely pleased um to have mandy with us um she's so experienced um and uh, we, you know, we're looking forward to the future, um, Mandy. And I think some of the comments that you've made about your experiences within meetings are probably echoed throughout the country. I've, I've heard many people talking about how they've been silenced at Labour meetings, isolated, um, shouted down, things like that. Um, and it, it, it's, well, for me, when I left, because I left on, decided to leave on my terms, um, I felt like there was just a weight lifted off my shoulders that I could now speak freely again. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, it takes a while to get used to the fact that you can post things that you want to post on your own social media without worrying, you know. You yeah. Can, yeah, and um, but there's a, a huge load of grieving with it as well, but I think there has yeah, been since 2019 anyway, you know. It's mm -hmm. a really, um, it rings you out, doesn't it, emotionally, the whole thing, the whole thing. It does. Yeah. It does. Well, let's hope that you're uh, well on the way to um, getting back up on your feet and uh, ready to fight again. We'll <laughs> take forward the good fight um, all together. Yeah. Um, so tonight, guys, we're talking to Mandy Clare. She's an independent councillor now from um, Cheshire West. And we're going to be discussing um, a project that's very dear to Mandy's heart um, on poverty, um, the poverty emergency, which is a very um, very pertinent right now um, for for many many people, um, particularly with the um, energy crisis that's looming. Um, so please hit that like button. We are live. The more people that press the thumbs up button, the more people who'll see this um, broadcast tonight. Um, so Mandy, councils and poverty isn't um, isn't poverty something that only governments can really change at the end of the day, or is it something that we can do ourselves? Um, I think that that is, it, it's fair to say that, you know, on a macro level, governmental change could have the biggest and quickest impact, definitely, you know, if there was the will, um, the government could do a lot more about poverty than it certainly is doing. But I also think that although councils have genuinely been through a really rough time and they have had severe funding cuts, you know, from the government, um, 
that there's a lot more that councils can do about poverty. You know, council, is, it's your local government. They control all of those local levers, you know, or so, so many of those local levers. And there's so much more that councils could do than they are doing um, to sort of not just alleviate the end results of poverty, but to also get up front and try and do more work around prevention and actually pulling up the roots more long term. Um, that I think it can be used as a little bit of a cop out sometimes, you know, like so in full council meetings, we often are treated to, you know, speeches, long speeches about why we have to make these tough decisions. And um, it's because we've had these these cuts handed down to us by government. And that is true. And, and it has been difficult. I mean, you know, we've had um, 450 million gap funding gap as a result of sort of increased costs and cuts combined since the Tories came in within Cheshire West. Um, we've had a doubling of unemployment since the pandemic and we've had um, like a, a quarter fold increase in people presenting, you know, with support, housing support, um, threatened with homelessness or haven't been made homeless and stuff like that. So that's had a huge toll alongside all of the normal COVID tolls that have had on families on our offices. And I would say particularly because we hear a lot, you know, we get, we, we congratulate senior officers an awful lot within full council, but it's the, uh, they're working from home, probably on a decent salary, you know, quite comfortably and the kind of poverty that they might be number crunching, but it's not affecting them directly day to day, but within our wider staff, you know, the staff that have had to go out and carry on working on the front line, it's been so, so hard and they're having to deal with all of the problems that are affecting people out there in the community that themselves have been really hard. So it's been difficult, but um, when, we, when we came through the first lockdown, it seemed to open up a window where we were able to sort of almost, I felt, glimpse beyond the type of um, society that we're used to living in. It sort of shook things up and changed everything to such an extent that people had time to reflect on how society is, but people also, um, you know, maybe weren't able to go out to work or we were hearing about statistics of people. Uh, one of the statistics that came out was around um, the impact that COVID, had, disproportionate impact that COVID had had on people who are from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. Um, and also with regards to people that are on low incomes. So people on low incomes, I think this was reported in the Marmot, Michael Marmot's um, report on COVID, that people on low incomes were over twice as likely to actually die, to actually lose their lives, you know, as a result of COVID. And we were also able to see See, I was just listening to um, an interview that I did on my website with Alice McLaren from Trademark Belfast um, earlier. Um, and she was talking about, you know, if you ask a senior executive officer or a group of them in a room, you know, if all of the CEOs stopped working for a week or two weeks, how would you know? How would you know that? Mm -hmm. But if the cleaners all stopped working and the delivery drivers all stopped working, you know, um, and your frontline carers all stop working for a couple of weeks, or, you, or the people who were empty in your bins, how would you know? So I think that COVID really helped us to sift out some of that. What do we as a society really need? And how massively undervalued those jobs and those people have been. Um, and I wanted us to try and relook at poverty, not just, uh, you know, um, because a lot of the time what people, you know, come back through council anti-poverty strategies the main thing seems to be let's get more people into work or people that are at a distance from the jobs market as they call it let's move those people closer to the jobs market or if you're in a low paid job let's just get you into a higher paid job but there's something deeper than that um you can't solve poverty by moving people into poverty work you know into exploitative insecure work for one thing the evidence shows us that if you're in a job where you've got no control and you're on a low wage and it's insecure um you've got a very low level of control about when what hours you work etc um you're more likely to be depressed you're more likely to feel suicidal you know so it's kind of these knock-on effects that we need to be more honest about rather than claiming that we're tackling poverty by getting x number of the population into work or closer to the jobs market we need to be honest about what kind of jobs are we funneling people into and is it acceptable you know that they're being paid in wages that they can't afford to survive on or they're just subsisting on and they can't cope if something comes out of the blue like the washing machine breaks down or whatever so there was an opportunity for us to have a, a relook i thought at how we're approaching society as a whole 
locally at the local level and what we can do about that through our, po our approach to poverty. So that's where the idea of the poverty emergency declaration came from. I'd been asked as the I'd been appointed to this role as the leaders champion for poverty and inequality. And I'd spent a few months finding out what we'd done in the, over the last few years, uh, what our previous strategies had looked like. And at first, I couldn't think what we could do better because it all looked fine. But it was after the lockdown, really, I became a lot clearer on it. And I thought, no, I want to put together a whole system for how we can almost try and seed a new type of economy, a different type of an economy and a completely different approach to poverty and a completely different approach to how we work as a council and with other councils on the issue of poverty and how we lobby government on poverty. I wanted to put a whole system together around that. Yeah, and you, you've been working very hard behind the scenes. Um, we're talking to Mandy Clare this evening. She's uh, an independent councillor from uh, Cheshire West, and we're talking poverty emergency. Uh, please hit that like button. It helps the algorithms on YouTube, and it will get our message out to a much wider audience. Um, so if, if you want to leave a, a question for Mandy in the chat, then please do so. And I'll put those to Mandy uh, later on in the show. So, Mandy, what was the pitch you made to the council and how did you sell it? And what were the main elements to this pitch? So, um, so I used a couple of levers, really. Um, one of them was the climate emergency declaration, because a few months before COVID, it was just before we went into the first lockdown, I think, the council had, um, someone had brought, you know, the climate emergency, um, a motion, you know, to commit the council to signing up to the climate emergency and developing a strategy around that. Um, and everyone gave their speeches and there were people from the public who came to speak on it really passionately. And it was unanimously voted through by all parties and the independents. Um, so I, that got me thinking and I just thought, well, if, if, after what we've all been through just now, and we know that you're, you're twice as likely to have died as a result of COVID and things were already bad because of austerity for people in poverty and on low wages before, then surely, you know, we can have a good go at seeing if we can get a decent number of people, councillors, to vote in favour of a poverty emergency. It is an emergency. Um, so let's like set out the reasons why it's an emergency and see, see where we get. So I approached... Um, I approached the leader of the council and just said, this is my idea. These are the kind of things, you know, that I'd like us to do. I'd like us to set it out as a social justice thing so that we're looking at the unfair system that causes poverty rather than looking at poverty as an individual poor choices thing. Because I think that's a cop out for councils and governments when we when we start doing that. Yeah. Um, let's have a look at the evidence and what the actual research and data that's already out there says. And let's just check whether our approach is actually evidence-based or whether we are, without realising it, using things like um, dominant media narratives around poverty and why people are poor and what needs to be done to solve poverty. Let's just check and let's make a commitment to making sure that as we go forward, it's evidence-based. But also, uh, so I explained all of this to her and I think um, she was in support generally um, and the chief exec I have to say has been surprisingly supportive you know when I thought if I said to them can we can we take a social justice approach to poverty I thought they'd run a mile <laughs> and I think in the first in the first draft of the report that was put together that was supposed to be between me and officers but these things uh, you know you don't you don't know how much of a councillor led document it's actually been by the end of it because the dead skills uh, are making sure that it you know I don't know um it's I think I don't know I think the social word social justice I'm not sure if they were still in there or or whatever but it the whole thing didn't translate into this report that went to cabinet in quite the way that I'd wanted it set out so what I did was um we, we, it was accepted by cabinet so that was fine so that meant it would come to full council and in the meantime when we got nearer to full council I'd done a little bit of um, promoting of it I'd been on the radio to talk about it and things like that um, another council had actually adopted it before we did because we didn't start having our meetings for a few months because of covid and um and I put an emergency motion in um, which was set out exactly how I wanted it um and that went in and it was that really that that um that that's that was the document really that encapsulated what what the system that I wanted us to promote and go with um 
but also Marcus Rashford, by the time we got around to having our meeting, Marcus Rashford had already been all over the news in the summer. And then again, as we were approaching Christmas about holiday hunger. And I think conservatives were really embarrassed by this stage about mm. the idea of kids going hungry in the holidays. Big up Mark, Marcus Rashford, by the way, he's one of our local boys. He's, he yes. lives near me. So, yeah, big up Marcus. <laughs> um so because of that that was that it just dropped at the right time as well so we had great public speakers um uh we had the climate emergency and this was kind of you know it was like well we can't we can't we've got to be as bothered about poverty as we are about climate and i think a lot of people could get behind that and also you know the embarrassment factor so we got all of the um, councillors from every political group, apart from the Tories, but five Tory councillors voted and a few of them abstained. And that was enough for us to have actually really strong cross-party support for something that was actually quite radical. It's quite a radical approach to poverty. So that was cool. So that's how I pitched it. Um, I asked the Green councillor if he would second it because it was about having a greener and fairer future beyond COVID. So I kind of framed it in that way. But actually his speech on poverty and his understanding of the issues, his grasp of it and the injustice and the social justice aspect of it was actually better than anyone else in the room, including me. He was absolutely amazing. Um, so I should thank him again for doing that because... Um, his, his, the, you know, he he spoke so powerfully on it. I'm sure that will have persuaded a lot of people that might not other have, otherwise have been persuaded as well. So, do you want me to sort of talk about the elements of it? What's yes, different please. about it? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> okay, I bet everyone's so, dying to know how you did it, <laughs> what it contains. Well, so you, your usual sort of. Um, anti-poverty strategy that isn't a poverty emergency anti-poverty strategy will have things like it'll be padded out with lots of stats um it'll tell people basically what the council already does a lot about a lot of the space will be padded out by saying here's all the stats for our area here's what we do here's what we do um it'll describe the link how it links to the other council strategy so there's loads of padding that's not actually saying what we're going to do you know and how we're going to measure what we're going to do um it'll it'll conflate uh it'll conflate alleviation of poverty so things like food banks debt counseling you know mental health support whatever it is that happens on the other end once poverty's already happened with um claim they, they claim that they're tackling poverty when in actual fact they're 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 just kind of clearing up the after effects of poverty in a way and only mm -hmm. partially at best, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So it'll conflate those things um, rather than talking about what's the difference between changing things and, and how we're going to measure what's different since the last strategy we put out about poverty and what's going to be different, what our aims are and how we're going to make sure we're measuring that we're making a change before the next strategy. So they tend to be fairly vague and they say things like, you know, we're going to get more people into better paid jobs and we're going to raise children's aspirations and we're going to do all these wonderful things and make sure everybody thrives, but they're not specific, you know. So our one, uh, the difference with this approach is that the first thing you do is you say that you're going to take a, a closer look at data and you're going to be very much more evidence based. Um, so you're going to take account of the what the research already says out there, because if you look at it, there's just stacks and stacks and stacks of evidence that's been presented over decades, which actually points to the fact that it's a systemic systemically caused issue it's not about individual choices and Michael Marmer actually did even say that within his um within his inequalities report as well it's not um you know it's it's um it's about the social determinants of poverty isn't it I suppose is what you could you could right. say mm -hmm. um so you take better account of what the what that says and you um also do a better job of, of measuring poverty within your own locality um, and your borough or whatever. Um, so rather than just sort of saying, like I said before, we're going to move X number of people into work, you would be specific and you would say what types of work you're moving into people into and what proportion of that what proportion of those people have been funneled into work that isn't really very good for them, that's you know um, insecure or is low paid and you'd say right this is our strategy this is how we're going to use our influence as a council to try and make sure that that proportion has reduced the next time we come to measure this and you'd have a number of things and we discuss things like having you know like a, a more detailed um good employment 
good employer award mm -hmm. or you could have an employer award that's at different levels so that when invest investors are moving into the borough you kind of encouraging them to comply you know with with what you've set out as your standards that yeah. you want to encourage um you can provide more investment into low-income communities to support and to seed um startup worker-owned co-ops for jobs that are that tend to be sort of insecure and low paid so like cleaning jobs and things like that have you got and, any uh, examples of those sorts of things mandy yeah so on my website which is called working class activist network i've got a little um section which is called praxis tv and i've done a series of interviews on there on youtube and um, one of them is with someone called Alice McLarnon, who is a founder member of Trademark Belfast, uh, is the Belfast Cleaning Society, and she's also a member of Trademark Belfast. So there are a group of women who work in class backgrounds um, from Belfast who uh, were working within sort of exploitative conditions as cleaners. Um, and the MTV Awards came to Belfast and the contract, the, the organization that was contracting the cleaning uh, pulled out of the uh, pulled out of it of the event and they were left without any cleaners so the women agreed between themselves that they'd, they'd actually been having um sort of political and social history education sessions and things like that as a way of sort of unifying the community um within northern ireland and the, the funding was coming to an end and they really wanted to continue because they felt as if some good relationships had been developed and um and and this seemed like an opportunity, a natural way for them to continue working together and develop something new. So they actually um, did that. They did the cleaning. It went great. Um, the company that ran the event were made up and they set up a women's cleaning co-op around that, which was work around. So every woman um, takes exactly the same wage. They've set that wage at a living wage level. Um, they can choose their own hours. They can choose who they want to work for, what, what customers they want to take on or not. Every woman can go and pay, pitch for work and price up work, can do, ev can do the books, can do every part of the process and everyone's valued equally. So it's, it's not just, um, I mean, they weathered the pandemic um, some of them had to go on furlough, but they agreed collectively that everyone would be paid at 100 percent of their income rather than 80 percent, which had happened in some other places. Um, and a lot of co-ops have actually been a lot more resilient through the pandemic as businesses because there's that collective um, investment you know, in keeping it going and that collective decision making and because it's not so much profit driven and they've got more flexibility to decide how they want to use the surplus at any given time, you know. So um, they've also been able to work around carer commitments um, and family commitments. Um, and so they're an absolutely brilliant example of working class people who've created not only um, you know, they've almost sidestepped capitalism a little bit. The way that capitalism has ravaged the people who are on the lowest incomes, who we actually most need and should value the most. They've actually got a way of doing that same job and that same business in a way that works much, much better for them. And it kind of provides a political education in and of itself, because when you're not trapped inside that exploitative system, you've got a little bit of distance on it and you can understand more clearly about how profiteering works and, and um you're not exploited anymore. So you, you're mm. able to sort of think those things through more analytically. It's not affecting you close on sort of thing. Yeah, so. we did do a show in the past um, about cooperatives and we spoke to, um, I think his name was Ian Abberton from the co-op and yeah. um, he explained how to set up a cooperative and um, where you can go and get further information on that and I think that's something that we need to revisit because um, if we if we're going to get out of this capitalist mess then we need to start educating people on how they can do things for themselves don't we Mandy? Definitely and the thing is if um, if you're providing as a council business advice to people and you've got staff who are employed to do that why would you not for the sake of some extra training advertise that you will also offer expertise in setting up worker own co-ops why would you not mm. do that you know especially after the experience we've had and why the, but the idea wouldn't be to just call it an inclusive economy because you're offering that support i think it's also about recognizing that if you offer 
co-op support, the people who are most able and most financially secure, who've got a bright idea, will very easily be able to take advantage of that offer. But the people who are really stressed out, who've never even considered doing something like that, maybe don't even know what that is, are least likely to be able to step forward and take advantage. So you have to go that bit further to reach into the communities that can actually most benefit from those models, you know, um, people that are, that are being the most exploited and have been the most harmed by the pandemic as well. So, so the idea was to kind of take it that bit further as well and to reach into those, organ, um, to those communities and make sure that we've got little community hubs that are just focused on poverty. So you're not there really to have a, a council service delivered at you, like, you know, smoking cessation or any of the other things that we associate with what councils provide in low income areas. It's there and it exists and it feels um, it feels like an empowering space where you can explore the issue of, of low income and how that's affecting you and you can collectivize and you can politicize around those issues, not in a party, not not in a party political sense, because a council wouldn't do that. But we all say as councils, well, we want people to have more, we want more civic engagement. But it's empty if we don't give people opportunities to yeah. actually talk about these things. And that's all that being politicised is. It's it's talking about and understanding why things are the way they are and coming together to find ways to fix them. So, you know, within these community hubs, the idea was you can have a list of all the different unions and um, how you get in touch with your local rep. You know, if the unions wanted to provide that, you could um, provide a home in the community for things like um, Unite Community, maybe. Um, you could have te tenants unions. Maybe we could support people to set up their own tenants unions for private tenants because um, there's more support kind of around social housing tenants as uh, you know, housing association and, and that kind of thing, I think. But for private people that were in the private sector, um, I know the one in Manchester has been absolutely brilliant because it really gets alongside people, but it doesn't do the job for them. It empowers people to reach out and do a lot of this stuff themselves so that they don't yeah. feel like someone's kind of patronising them or doing it for them. And then they in turn can get alongside someone else and help them in the same way. It's just absolutely amazing. So it, it was just the idea was to try and... Um, have a much more empowering model of community education and activism within the lowest income communities, specifically around the issue of poverty um, and to change the narrative. So um, to stay away from things like social mobility and and think to, some of those terms are really problematic because they imply that as long as everybody starts doing a, a paid job and gets better trained, it, it'll solve this problem but of course if you think know, about this new term the Tories have introduced about leveling up oh my gosh right I, I mean they what does it even mean doesn't yeah it's not defined and what do you think so leveling up like to what <laughs> exactly <laughs> and, exactly and how what? and yeah and it's I think a lot of it is geographical as well they're talking about areas so they're looking at the whole area and saying well we need to have more industry in this area and you know, uh, better better uh, public transport links in that area. But it's kind of, I mean, yes, that that's important. Obviously, that's important. But that's almost like a macro level, isn't it? Now, haven't um, we heard all this before, though, with the Northern Powerhouse and all this bullshit, you know? We have. It, yeah. And it is. It, it's, it's just words without any meaning. Um, it no is. Plan. It is. And I think also unless we because we simplify it down as well a lot of the time and ignore the evidence. So we'll say, you know, children um, fail to thrive at school as a result of poverty. And yeah, they do. And they are less school ready, you know, and, and all of this. But I mean, I if 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 we don't acknowledge as well that there's lots of research out, out there that says that the actual school system itself is designed in a way that if you are a kid that's coming from a home that's financially comfortable you've already got a hundred other and the way that um the way that things happen within the actual school system itself it that that disadvantage grows oh don't um, start me Mandy. Yeah, and so that is <laughs> Some of that is as a result of the actual system. You'll never shut me up. <laughs> no, the result of the actual system itself. And we've got loads of evidence around how that happens, yeah. but we don't talk about that, about what actually happens within schools. like, And also things like um, access to private tuition and access to, um, you know, connections to help you to get into the right job and all of this kind of thing, these social connections 
net connections. And classism, the way that classism works, it's not in included within the Equality Act, but it's massively influential, you know, in children's actual chances. So if we tell children that we need to raise your aspirations, they are always going to think, well, I didn't aspire enough. You know, there was some problem with my aspiration. It wasn't to do with the fact that they had loads of advantages that I couldn't see. They just, they just managed to do really well for some reason that I couldn't, you know, it must have been intelligence or a lack of will on my part. And kids internalize that stuff. If we, mm -hmm. if we don't talk honestly about classism and how that affects people actually within the classroom year on year. You what, Andy, as, a, as a primary, sorry to interrupt, but as a, as a primary school teacher or former primary school teacher, yeah. um, one of, you know, I worked in a, in a, a you know, a low socioeconomic, um, very diverse uh, primary school in yeah. Manchester. And, um, you know, our, our families, they were working poor. They worked their backsides off. You know, we had mums and dads who had like, mums were working three jobs. Dad was working, you know, nights and days and all hours of the day. And I saw it as part of my job to support those parent parents um, in mm -hmm. helping them to, with their education, you know, and they didn't have time to listen to the children read um, at night because they're too busy trying to put food on the bloody table. Yeah. Um, you know, so so I, I'd sit there and, you know, read with them during break times and lunch times and things like that. And um, but there's not enough of that understanding um, no. in schools. No, there isn't. And you shouldn't, in a way, as a teacher, have to work three times as hard because you're teaching in a deprived area. You know, the fact that you've got children where they're coming from deprived backgrounds and their parents are going to be more stressed about money and they're going to have less time and less energy, etc. The government should be providing extra teachers in those areas, not blaming yeah. them for not doing as well as Absolutely. they might be doing in other areas. It's yeah. shocking that we don't acknowledge this yeah. because there's loads of research out there about this. So I think it's about us also me wanting us to change the conversation, you know, um, around what the causes are. There's loads of them. There's loads of causes of poverty, but also mm -hmm. what the effects are of classism as well in every every direction you want to look, you know. Um, so, yeah, so change is about the narrative because a lot of the, like, so when I took this um, uh, proposition to the full council, there were a couple of remarks that came back um, along the lines of, yeah, but these people need to be taught how to budget better. And yeah, but nobody's mentioned yet that people need to be willing to work and stuff like that. And then we had to talk about in-work poverty and we had to talk about, um, you know, uh, it's not, you, you, can't, you can't put this down to budgeting skills. Poverty, you can't simply explain poverty away by budgeting skills or by a lack of healthy eating or it's because you smoke or you know we've got to get real about what the actual okay, causes are these, yeah. these are all, these are all sound bites that come out of the sun and the mail and you know it, and they are sound bites and people just repeat them without yeah. actually knowing what yeah. is the truth yeah and sometimes people um, repeat them just without even thinking like within councils councillors do it as well yeah senior officers do it as well you know so I just wanted to try and stop us in our tracks a little bit and think hang on a minute what are we saying you know mm -hmm. and is it accurate and is it backed up by evidence and um you know so there was that there was the community hubs which I've explained a little bit about um not conflating alleviation with systemic change so being clear what we're talking about so if it's alleviation great that still needs to happen um, but let's call it what it is let's not pretend that we're tackling poverty when we're doing if we're just doing that you know um or that that's going to sort poverty out because it won't you know you're only you're only clearing up after the event um and i wanted it to be ethical in other ways as well <laughs> uh, so i wanted um so there's there's a trend towards uh, lived experience and making sure that people who've got lived experience, not just within sort of working with around poverty, but in loads of different areas, um, professional areas of work around um, children and families, um, that lived experience voice is really valued nowadays, which it should be and it's right. But my experience, and I'll be careful about what I say, um, because the group's still up and running, my experience is that that can be misused by councils in quite a cynical way. Um, and I think it's better practice for people with lived experience of poverty to be supported outside of councils. So if you've got a council that's working on a strategy, they're going to have a certain angle that they want to approach it from. 
and they're already going to have that set in stone what they're comfortable with and how far they're happy to be pushed on it. So to pretend that that same organisation can take an unbiased role in leading a lived experience group of people who've they're just coming with their experience of having been poor and disempowered. That's all they're, they're coming with initially. They're not coming with skills and awarenesses of how they can be manipulated, you know, to, to, to stay on track um, with what the council's vision really is. Um, but councils do have parameters that they're comfortable to work within and certain lines where they're not comfortable and to kind of pretend that they're there as a neutral partner just to facilitate people to say whatever they want and challenge them in any which way they like is disingenuous mm. um and um so i've I, yeah I've, I've had some thoughts around the ethics of that as a result of my experience of, of just witnessing some of that yeah. um, and will you be putting stuff like that onto your website well, yeah, I'm going to work on it over time. Whether whether it'll ever come to any use to anybody, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. Uh, listen, Mandy, yeah. uh, we're quickly running out of time. It's uh, okay. we've got around 15 minutes left, and yeah. um, we've still got some questions to take. So, okay. if you do want to ask Mandy a question, please pop them in chat now, and we shall be asking them very shortly. So the final the final element just quickly is about collectivizing councils and lobbying governments. So we lobby governments as councils on all sorts of things all the time. So um and not just to um yeah, not just to lobby them to say give us more money, but to lobby them to say there needs to be a social justice approach to poverty. Here's what the here's what the data and evidence says. We've, we're doing a better job on collecting more accurate data locally now and other councils who've also declared a poverty emergency have also got data that backs that up. And it was to work more as a collective with other councils who've declared poverty emergencies to collect similar data sets and to collaborate and to, to collectively lobby governments to try and influence change at the national level um, on everything to do with this strategy and this approach. Uh, and we created a website and the intention of that was to use that as a hub to actually um, land some of those statistics and to land some examples of good practice from other areas as well. And just work as, as more of a cohesive collective. Nine other councils, I think it was, or eight other councils declared poverty emergencies, but um, not necessarily including all of those elements within their declaration. So um, that, that hasn't really materialised in the way that I would have liked it to, but that was the intention of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, Mandy. So are you ready for some questions? I am. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so Christine Powell, I, first of all, I want to thank everybody for joining the chat tonight. It's been moving really fast. Um, and we, I can see we've got a lot of new viewers this evening as well. So thank you for joining us. And whilst you're here, why don't you subscribe? Um, hit that like button and the notification bell. We're here live every Wednesday. Uh, so Christine Powell on Facebook says, I left the Labour Party in January 2000. My mental health was suffering due to the treachery it was liberating council funding has been slashed by the tories how can we get funding for services back well i think i don't know if you if you have um if you have a, a group of people locally who would work with you on it you could get in touch with me or have a look on Cheshire Western Chester poverty emergency if you just search that on Google you can see the motion that I put together in the form of the poverty emergency declaration on that website if you can get your local council to adopt something like that even if it's not the full thing something along those lines and contact Cheshire West um the leader's champion for poverty and inequality now is councillor Lisa Denson. So you could contact her. You can also contact me um, just, you know, to, to if you want any further help around that. The more councils really that we can, the more people that can take this to their local council, try and get local councillors on board, mm -hmm. present it and shame their local councillors into signing up to something like this then you know maybe we could build a, a collective around that and jointly lobby the government because this is what i was and also any good examples of good practice we need to be 
share in those. So the purpose of that poverty emergency website that Cheshire Western Chester have sent up is precisely that. It's um, where there are amazing examples like that one in Belfast, where working class people have taken power back into their own hands, sidestepped capitalism to some extent, and created something that's actually increased political awareness amongst working class people, as well as the amount of power they have, um, you know, allows them to, to, to bring that collective approach to life. Um, then share share it, let us know about it, and, and we can put that on the website. But we we need a change of government. But the idea of this as well is that we could wait forever for a change of government. And even if we get one, if it's Keir Starmer, it might not make a huge amount of difference anyway. Um, so it's about trying to think about what we can do at the grassroots level, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what we're all about here um, at Resist. And um, and we're building a new political party, which should be registered within the next couple of weeks. Um, so um, join us and be part of the, the change. And uh, let's go forward and make policies together that is going to make real radical improvements to people's lives. Um, Emily Morton says, Mandy, have you looked at the Preston model led by Matthew Brown, which was a Corbyn policy project for community led policies? Yeah, I have. And I've been in touch with Matthew and he sent me his email and said, get in touch. And I've not, I've never got around to doing it. <laughs> but um, he's also, there's, there's a community of people around the community wealth building model that all know each other. Um, and what someone that I am in touch with now and again is someone called Joe Guinan. Um, he's from, um, well, he worked a long time in on the Cleveland model. And it was from the Cleveland model that the Preston model was taken sort of thing. That's where it's been developed from. Um, it was um, evergreen co-ops, I think they set up. So they're co-ops, which are uh, I think they're, they're worker owned, but they're evergreen because they're set up in such a way that they can never become privatized. They can never become anything else. They're always there um, for the next generation of the community. Um, and he's got loads of interest in things to say. I would love to interview him. You should interview him sometime, actually. Mm, get him on. Um, maybe yeah. get him and, and Matthew Brown on as well, just that to talk brilliant. about this. Because there's but the, the thing is, though, if they're still in labor, with the resistance being yeah. described, they yeah, won't yeah, yeah. Come on. that's the issue. I don't know if Joe is. I'd have to check. He's fairly scathing on Twitter, so he might not be. I don't know. <laughs> They've probably <laughs> thrown him out by now. <laughs> <laughs> he might have done, yeah, I'll have to check. But um, that, that it, yeah, it's community wealth building, it's that um, terminology that can be easily used in a very watered down way as well. Um, so the the important thing I think is to have a look at a, a number of different models and how they've been implemented. And what I wanted us to really try and avoid doing within Cheshire West was to t take the cop out option and do it the easy way and not do it thoroughly kind of thing. And there's ways and ways of doing that. And people sometimes use the same labels for very different things. Um, but he's pretty bona fide, I think, in his, his approach that he takes. And Matthew Brown as well, as I understand it is also. So, yeah. OK, um, we've got a comment from Kevin Clegg. Um, when the BBC came uh, came up to Salford, um, I was hoping it would level up Manchester, pr providing media jobs, which were always in London. Instead, what happened was gentrification. Southerners came up and took the jobs. Yeah, uh, yeah that was true. Um, yeah. And um, a lot of houses, it was a lot of housing as well put the prices of housing up in this area yeah. because they were selling yeah. their properties down in London which were worth an absolute fortune so they could afford much bigger houses up here in Manchester yeah. and um, yeah it, it oof, the, the house prices just went ridiculous. It's like the endless promise, isn't it, of capitalism and development? You know, people are told, well, we're going to, this development's coming and it's going to transform the area and it's going to be so economically beneficial. And you just have to ask, like, what were your before and after figures? Are there as many people poor now as there were then? What what actually changed as a result of that mm. development, you know, for people that are struggling? Because yeah, we never definitely. hear that. We never hear it on the other side, people saying it came and here's the difference it made, yeah. you know. So, yeah. but yeah. that's because it's good for them, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Shirley Lysat says, uh, when a person has to claim benefits to top up their salaries, they're being abused by bosses. If they can't pay decent pay, they shouldn't be bosses. And the other thing is, Shirley, that probably that corporation is not paying as much tax as you and me because they yeah. get huge uh, discounts in their tax. 
Oh, oh God, don't start me on ta child tax credits. <laughs> I was on the phone 45 minutes waiting for them to answer today. <laughs> and it's I like... claimed child tax benef uh, benefits when I was at university. And yeah. um, about five years later, they tried to um, claw back three and a half thousand pounds off me. When I, I was a student at the time, yeah. I, I, you know, I'd used it to because um, my two kids were babies at the time. So I had to use it for childcare yeah. whilst I was studying. I've just found out today I'm entitled to free school meals, but I've been misadvised again and again that I'm not entitled. Um, and you never get that. You never get that repaid. <laughs> like if they give you the wrong advice and you've paid out of your own pocket and struggled, they never say, oh, yeah, we misadvised you. We sh you were entitled to it all this time. Here you go. Yeah, I know you won't yeah. get the money back. No, no. no but no. but they're they're quick to claw it back when they think they've paid you incorrectly. Um, this, yeah. Jonathan Cooper asked a question. Um, how far would you agree that the left's future electoral strategy lies in local elections and local base building? Local based local base building. Yeah. Um I'm not sure what you mean by that. The left, yeah, for the left as a whole. Um you, who knows because things can change rapidly as we've seen over the last couple of years um, and as we're seeing now with the unfolding energy crisis you know people are already poor and and struggling um i don't know it would like it would be nice to think that there would be a quicker route than that but anybody who is inclined to put themselves forward for local government who is on the left i would say do it because we're going to need people bringing up the reserves if we get lucky Mm. aren't we yeah absolutely um i can can i just have a give a shout out to lizzie who um normally is either hosting or moderating we do a bit of a double act um she's poorly sick in bed so get well soon lizzie lots of love to you um she has posted a message in um in chat saying what oversight did you have of the the council or what do you have of the council bank accounts as a councillor um no you don't have as much detail as perhaps you might like um and you don't have as much training in reading accounts as perhaps you might like as well and you don't have enough time this is the thing is as a counselor you come in and you're kind of pulled in all directions and you're expected to try and learn about a, a massive range of of new things new areas of work um whilst also sort of supporting local people in the ward that you represent and all the meetings that you're expected to attend as well. Um, I think uh, councillors, it would be good if councillors had more time to actually get together. I know that um, in Liverpool they did, didn't they? They've got together and they come up with an alternative budget. And I think Jo Bird did some work around that in the Wirral as well. And she offered to work with myself and a couple of other councillors within Cheshire West. And I've I suggested that idea, but... Um, we just haven't had time to sit down and do it. But we're yeah. quite often asking each other questions, you know, and you don't always get the answers that you should do, either from cabinet of the same party that you're in or from officers. It, it is difficult with any area. When you talk about officers, yeah. are you talking about um, party officers or are you talking about council officers? Council officers. Mm. Well, I mean, the now, thing is... They're employees, though, aren't they? Yeah, but you've got to think of it. I mean, they're there as public servants, but mm -hmm. there's all there's also this element of being a council senior officer that you if you're running a, a ship, and it's all going fine. And every four years, a bunch of new people come in who've got no clue how this ship operates and works. You know, so you can understand it from their point of view to an extent that they don't want too much disruption to how they how they're doing things, even though it is supposed to be a publicly accountable, electorally, you know, um, accountable system. In, mm. in theory, it should be. Yeah, it's not as easy as you might hope. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I would like to tell people that, um, you know, we are hoping to do, um, if you join the Resist movement um, on 
resistmovement.org.uk. Um, we are trying to put together um, lots of different webinars um, to discuss policy areas. Um, we'll be bringing experts in, we'll be having those debates as members um, and hopefully Mandy will be able to do a longer stint uh, as on a webinar um, showing us um, the motions that she's produced, um, how the strategy works, um, toolkit that you can use to lobby your council um, on, and your local councillors on those different issues and, and maybe, you know, giving some more evidence as to what people have done in their localities um, for themselves, um, that would be really good. Um, so, um, Mandy, just before we go, how can people find out more information? Um, I did put the uh, website address up there. I'll put it up again. But how can they find out more information? How can they contact you if they want to ask any questions? Well, um, my council email address um, is mandy.clare at cheshirewesternchester.gov.uk. Um, there's my class activist, uh, class activist, oh, is it class activist at gmail.com if it's in relation with my work on social class and um sean you'll have to say what my northwest email is because i can't remember for resist it's northwest at resistmovement.org.uk <laughs> oh thank you so much for tonight mandy i hope people have um got some really good ideas out of what you've been telling us um i think this program could have gone on for another hour easily mm -hmm. um, and it's been lovely chatting to you and uh, I hope we can do this again soon so thank you everybody in the chat thank you to Mandy get well soon Lizzie and we'll see you all next Wednesday good night thank you bye bye